Well, welcome to the last session. I'm sure everybody, uh, uh, after two days of meetings, are ready to get out and raise a glass or uh, enjoy Chicago, watch basketball playoffs on the tube. Um, I'm John Harwood with uh, CNBC and the New York Times. Uh, and I'm here with a panel to talk about stories beyond the horse race and what they are and how we should cover them and how we should make sure they don't get lost. Um, I'm here with Michelle Salcedo of the Associated Press, with Perry Bacon of NBC News, and Robert Costa of the Washington Post. And so let's just get into it. Um, a few uh, observations at the beginning. First of all, I'm very glad to be here with uh, two longtime friends and colleagues, David Axelrod, who I met in 1987 when he was working for the presidential campaign of Paul Simon, a great public servant, tremendous guy to interview, um, enjoyable campaign that had a season in the sun. Uh, it didn't last all that long, but, uh, but, it, but he had his moment. And Anne-Marie Lipinski, who was my classmate uh, as Neiman Fellows uh, at Harvard in 1989 and 90, and we've been friends ever since. Um, let me just first make this point. One of the obligations that we have as reporters is to figure out what are the big things, what are the important things beyond the horse race that we need to cover, why are they important, how do we balance between what's interesting and what's important, uh, how do we take account of not only what we consider significant, but what other people who aren't like us uh, consider significant because we all know that the biggest bias in journalism may not be how a particular story is constructed but the selection of the story in the first place. So what are the things that we pay attention to and, and in particular uh, do, we, do we value things that are material, dollars and cents versus spiritual? Um, you know, David talked earlier uh, when we were out in the hallway about well, Obama proposed to get a bunch of things done and he proposed to change Washington. Well, he, he did the former but not the latter. Um, personally, my own value system, I never expected much from the latter and figured that was the lighter part of the, of the promise from Obama and that the, the substantive part was more important, but that's not necessarily true. It just depends on your view of the importance of how the country sees Washington and views the political process. And there's a value to that apart from whether you have health care or whether uh, financial institutions are regulated in a different way. Um, so all of those things, I think, are, are worth discussing. And I'm going to start with you, Michelle, with a, a really a demographic question, which I don't, somebody asked me that the other day when, asked me this question when we were putting together this panel. I didn't know the answer, and I should have thought about it more given the changing nature of our population, but why are there so few Latino political reporters, and how do you think that the political reporting profession should make sure that issues that matter to Latinos are kept alive in the conversation? I think that, um, you know, that's, a, that's an excellent question, and it's one that um, the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, for one, has been uh, wrestling with uh, since their inception. It's one of the reasons that they were formed more than 30 years ago. And nobody's got an answer. I think part of the issue was the uh, reporters that had been hired into legacy media, um, so many of them uh, were laid off. In, in when, the, when the industry contracted in 2006, 2007, 2008, all through there. And we really haven't had an opportunity to, uh, to rehire. And now we have um, social media, which uh, those demographics really haven't changed either. Um, there's a theory that um, the more people you put in hiring positions of color, the more your uh, newsroom will diversify. Um, but again, because so many people who were on those tracks were laid off, um, it's really kind of left us with a, with a dearth. And so I think that... Um, Is there a hole in our coverage as a result? I think there's definitely a hole in our coverage, and, and I, I've only um, had the opportunity to be here today. But just in um, looking at some of the presentations, 
Um, I saw some African Americans. I didn't see any Latinos. I didn't see the issue of Latinos being raised at all. And, and the participation rate for Latinos is considerably lower, like double digit lower, than uh, whites and African Americans. And yet, it's the, lar it's the fastest growing demographic in this country. There are, um, by 2025, I think it is, an estimated 1 million Latinos will turn, will, will come of age, will turn 18 um, per year. That's a million people who are eligible to vote per year. And yet, right now, the participation rate is in the 30s. Is it, it's around 30% of eligible voters. That in order for us to have a voice in the policies that are, that are, that are, that are being formulated, uh, not only in Washington, but even as locally as the school boards, we really need to get that, we really need to get those numbers up. And in order to do that, and in order for us not to be siloed, mainstream media, the legacy media, as well as some of the um, organizations that we saw that some of the social media and the new media platforms really need to be much more inclusive than they are. Perry, you've spent a lot of time covering the issue of health care. Um, give me your, it's my observation, both from my own experience in news organizations, that there's a lot more attention paid to the controversy around health care, the political fights over it, that, uh, than to the substantive implementation of it, where the healthcare, how the healthcare system evolves from here. What do you think on that subject ought to be the reporting agenda for the 2016 campaign? Um, yeah, I've been, to, I've been doing this project for a couple of years about Obamacare, so I've been to a lot of state capitals as the um, debate about expanding Medicaid has started to continue. You know, we talked a lot about what happened when passing Congress, but since then you have basically 25 states that are participating, 25 states that aren't, and there's a big debate about do you participate in the program, do you not, Republican governors still remain pretty opposed to that. It seems to me the debate in the campaign is going to be in some ways still about that, because you still have a block of candidates who are saying on the right who are saying, I don't think it's realistic to see you're going to, the law at this point impacts 16 million people is by the last estimate who have health insurance who didn't have it in 2010. So it's hard for me to see, even though they're all saying they're going to repeal the law, it's hard for me to see they're going to repeal the law. I think the more relevant questions might be if we can get them to talk about any detail, what kinds of ways they would seek to limit it and uh, things like that. And for Secretary Clinton might be like, what kinds of ways there's still 30 million people in America who don't have health insurance. So that might be a first place to go, figure out what is what are her plans to sort of build on it if she has any in detail? And then if we can get past the sort of repeal discussion, I mean, the Republican candidates have to say that that's part of what's happening. If we can get some more detail from them, I think that would be helpful on the way um, on the health care question. And then the other question is a lot of other health care system questions. Um, I saw Jeb Bush a couple days ago talked about the idea of, you know, the idea of end of life care and take, talking about kind of the kinds of reforms around that. If you remember doing the health care debate, the health care law debate, there was a whole notion that the we were creating death panels, and this was terrible, and so on. Um, and that was not really true, of course. But I saw Jeb Bush a few days ago talked about the fact that we need to think about how do people die in our system, and like how do we get to a point where we, we, you know, we spend a lot of money in the last five years of people's lives, like sending their lives in ways occasionally they don't like themselves. And if there's some discussion about Medicare spending overall, end of life, end of end of end of life care as well. I think those are issues where there might be room to ask the candidates questions, maybe get answers that are kind of beyond the obvious. Robert, I want to ask you, as someone who's made a relatively rare migration, I would say, from a conservative magazine, the National Review, to the Washington Post, a legacy mainstream media uh, publication, whatever you want to call it, um, I wonder about your reflections on the kinds of things that people at National Review thought were important beyond the horse race, the kinds of things that the Washington Post believes are important, whether there's a difference, and whether you, you know, one of the, the critiques that conservatives have had of, uh, some conservatives have had of mainstream organizations is they're very secular, uh, they're, they're uh, people of faith, and the concerns of people of faith are, are uh, underrepresented, uh, and it's, you know, moderate to, to left rather than conservative. How do you, tell me about your perspective in both of those environments. Well, I think regardless of which publication you work for or which media company you work for, w when you look at these political issues, there's a challenge to get beyond the horse race. And I face the same thing at National Review as I do at the Washington Post. 
And I think every day as a reporter, uh, really the hard thing to do is to ask yourself, are you really trying to get beyond what's being covered that day, what the, the media controversy is, and to really think about the decisions being made, why are the decisions being made, what are the consequences of these decisions? And to think of it not red, blue, conservative publication, liberal publication, mainstream legacy, but really think of yourself as a reporter. You're not just representing a brand. It's your integrity that matters. It's your questions that matter. And, how, and so I've really had a transition that's been simple because I always think every day about what's happening with power, what's happening with people. And when it comes to the evangelical question, the religious faith question, it's not just so much, will you go to a gay wedding? That's, a, that's an important question. It's one that's popped up. Uh, but it's really, what does this tell us about the Republican Party? That's what I would ask at Ash Review. That's what I would ask at the Washington Post. What, not only what are the responses, but what aren't they saying? And on health care, with the Affordable Care Act, a lot of people privately in the Republican Party seem to acknowledge that it's here to stay. How, how are they expressing that acknowledgment? What aren't they saying about health care? And so, when it comes to the institution you work for, I, I would distance yourself from it in the sense that you're not who you work for. You are yourself as a reporter, and, and it's your duty to come up with enterprising ways and looking at questions and not just settle back on doing stories that you think kind of reflect whatever the, the, the paper or network wants. Well, I want to ask a basic question, everybody to respond to a basic question, and I'll respond to it first myself. And the question is, what is the most important issue beyond the horse race in 2016? I will say from my point of view, the most important issue facing American politics is what we can do to raise the living standards of average people that have been stagnant for 40 years. But that is the bias of someone who has mostly covered domestic affairs, not, um, uh, not foreign policy. I could imagine someone else would say, the most important uh, issue beyond the horse race is what does America do in the fight against Islamic extremism? Or from a different perspective, uh, what does America do about the change in the climate and how that affects our futures? Michelle, how would you answer that question? I think that's a very important question and, and um, one that, that a lot of the candidates are, are trying to address heaven knows at this point generally without a lot of specifics. I think another, um, I think another important issue is voter participation. And not only voter participation, but also um, voting why vote, rights. Why voter participation? That's not, that, that's not what some people would consider a substantive outcome. That's a process kind of thing. Why, why do you think that's important? Because I think it's a key right in this democracy. And I think that in order for democracy to work, you have to have voter participation. And so when you have, um, when you open the system up, you get more voices. And when you get more voices, you, you have a better, a, more, a richer discussion, and you're able to formulate better policy. So that, so that the way you look at it, uh, there's something much larger at stake in, say, uh, discussion of voter ID laws than campaign mechanics or uh, the competition between campaigns. Absolutely, I think it goes back to um, it goes back to why the people were on the bridge in Selma, Alabama, and in those instances, in in that particular instance, and in those marches, um, it, it was about voting rights specifically in the southeastern United States. But the fact of the matter is that there were barriers put up for. Mexican Americans specifically in the West as well. And so that the fight that, that went on 50 years ago and that, that blacks so courageously were in the forefront of, um, in fact, has been going on in this country for many people of color. And it continues today. And I think that we need to, I think we need to pay more attention to it as a civil right as opposed to a mechanical voting process. Perry, what's the most important issue beyond the horse race? Um, one, okay, I'm not going to give one. I think, I think the, actually the most important issue is, I think, this sort of, <laughs> I'm going to give one, this sort of stagnant wages, in, income inequality. You're seeing that in rural parts of the country. You're seeing that in Baltimore some this week. You saw these sort of persistent challenges about why is the economy not working for a lot of people, the new guild. I think that's the one A, I would, you know, I would say, I would add also, I think is important as well, is how do we deal with the changing America? Like whether it's, um, uh, whether more, it's gay rights, whether it's 
being women's rights, whether it's uh, oh, there's African American rights. I think these sort of the, the demographic changes in the country and like our and how we adapt to them, I think is really Robert referred to this question about it seemed like a silly question, I think, at first, but the question of like, would you attend a same sex wedding actually captured something that's really going on. There's a lot of changes in the country about how Bacow is becoming a more diverse and ethnically more secular in some ways country. And I think the candidates are But don't are, we already know the answer to that question that we're in fact racing toward the answer which is we're, we're moving full speed in the direction of tolerance and th that, that's a game that's been decided? I don't think so. So I think I would, I would sort of hesitate to say that it's going to be in a country that passed We've had a bunch of like voter ID laws passed, and maybe you know, and there's some debate about what those purpose of those are. But I think a lot of African Americans would say those laws are passed to limit voting. So I would not say that maybe on some parts of gay rights. So yeah, yeah, will, will we have same-sex marriage by next year? By by next June, probably. But I'm not sure that uh, there's still you know can you can couples adopt who want to in some states? Do you, the religious freedom laws I think were a big example, obviously in Indiana, of like where these issues are still contested. Are we moving toward? I'm sure. I mean, are we moving toward tolerance? Sure, but. If you're not every day, if you feel like you're being discriminated against, the day you're not discriminated against. So I think that the rush for that will continue to be a big issue. Robert? Well, I think the joy of, of being a political reporter is that you don't know the answer to that question about what the biggest <laughs> issue is. And I'm trying to grapple with that every day. And well, so but I'm, you help determine what the answer to the question is by the stories that you choose to pursue. And I think when you choose to pursue those stories, I think the horse race has real value to figure out this question. Uh, I think one of the tendency for, for some, old, some reporters is to ignore the uh, horse race up, endorsements, uh, small events, meetings, uh, minutia, but it, all that adds up into being something meaningful to help answer these larger questions. And so I think being aggressive as a reporter on the smaller things about what uh, gay rights groups are doing, what conservative groups are doing on the ground, um, who, who, who's associating with campaigns, who's not. These help tell the larger story. And I don't, I don't know if it's reporters, uh, I, we have to not answer the question about what's the biggest issue, but I think John brings up a great point. You've got to be thinking big. What is, how is populism, how is income inequality factoring into day-to-day -day campaigning? And, and have the issue of a Republican Party, populism, how are they dealing with it? How is the Elizabeth Warren wing influencing Bernie Sanders and his race and Hillary Clinton? All these things are bubbling up and clouding the whole campaign. And you always have to be cognizant of that because you don't want your stories just to be spot stories that tell the who, what, when, where, an event. You want to give context. And you think not just about something that's happening, but tell the story of why it matters. And, and I think that's the duty of reporters, to figure out kind of why it matters without saying this is the biggest issue of the day. Um, a question that arises out of the several of the answers and, and what's been happening in Baltimore. One of the striking things for people uh, my, around my age uh, about the rise of Barack Obama was how quickly we saw a successful African American candidacy, but it was of a particular type. It was of someone who had the ability uh, to uh, speak not in and frame his campaign, not in racial terms, but in universal terms. Um, I, and he's gotten some criticism, in fact, for not um, articulating enough of a, the particular points of view until the second term of his presidency um, relating to the uh, uh, issues uh, of African Americans. I wonder if we're moving in the opposite direction, that if the increasing diversity of the electorate, the fact that non-white voters are looming larger and larger uh, in our campaigns, that uh, economic issues that are framed in terms uh, uh, overlapping racial terms. The fate of young kids in Baltimore where race and economy are sort of interlocking problems. Uh, is that something that we're going to, is coverage going to move in that direction toward more explicit coverage of racial issues rather than framed in a common way, in a universal way? I guess I would say I hope so. I mean, the short end, I mean, we've, uh, I don't, I mean, the president had to be elected by speaking in a sort of post racial or 
way, and I'm not using the right term, the president had to play down race to win, I would argue, um, particularly in 2008. I don't think we as a media should have just like fought. I think we and me as a journalist, I would say, sort of follow that instinct as well. But there are statistics. I mean, there's a, there's a book out that a lot of people are talking about now. It's called The New Jim Crow. And it came out in 2010, but it's become more influential. And the idea being a lot of our public policies, whether intentionally or unintentionally, resulted in a lot of, of you know, a, sort of a mass incarceration problem that is very, very large. This is not a new problem, but you're seeing for the first time is really being, if you gave, you heard Senator Clinton's speech a few, a few weeks ago where she went to, in New York, she was talking about the 1.5 million African-American men who are sort of missing from our society. That's a story itself that we should cover in a very precise way. Like what's happening in a place like Baltimore? Why is poverty so, so persistent and so strong? And so I, I think you're already seeing that. And I, I know Jeb Bush wrote an op-ed about his solutions for Baltimore. But I think you are going to see more coverage about kind of what's going on in the African-American community, what's happening in the Latino community. I think that's necessary. I think that's helpful. And we have, we have, I would say, more outlets than ever who can do that kind of specialized coverage. So I think that is helpful. It's, I mean, you shouldn't cover inequalities happening to all parts of the population. There are plenty of rural whites who are struggling with the same challenges in terms of stagnant wages. But I do think there are sort of targeted problems that we should talk about and like, you know, be, you know, being less sort of race neutral and more conscious of races factor in our politics is a very important thing that I hope happens in this campaign coverage. Michelle, do you see more race conscious identity journalism? I think what this gives us an opportunity, I think what, what Ferguson and Baltimore and the Albuquerque Police Department, for example, gives us an opportunity to examine the results, the effects of policy. Um, and it, it sounds kind of wonkish, and it sounds like it might be kind of a snore, and I guess that's our job, and I know it's our job to make it kind of, to make it more interesting. But the fact is that a lot of the reason some of these, these inequalities exist go back to policies that were made 40 and 50 years ago. The housing policy is a perfect example of that. I think it was NPR had a story about um, how Levittown and the decision to sell only to whites enabled our parents' generation and therefore our generation to have, to accumulate personal wealth, to send their kids to school um, so that they could uh, be well educated, get white collar jobs, accumulate wealth themselves, and it kind of went on. The policy toward blacks was to provide public housing, which was basically rental, and they never got the opportunity through public policy, through, through conscious public policy, to, um, to accumulate those wealth, and now, to, to accumulate that wealth, to, to get that education. And now as a result, we're seeing these incredible disparities and, and that have very complicated solutions. So I, I, I think it gives us an opportunity to do kind of a, uh, to, to put more context into what is happening and hopefully not repeat the mistakes that were, that were made in the past. Michelle, when you think about how the media covers issues of concern to Hispanics, substantive issues, and then you think about immigration in that context, does it occupy too much of the space or uh, at the expense of uh, other economic, social, uh, cultural issues that are important to Latino voters, or is it right that it has become this sort of um, lens through which we enter that discussion? Immigration is really a litmus test for, for Latino voters, and it's a, it's a litmus test in the sense of it gives them an opportunity, it gives Latino voters and, and Latinos in general an opportunity to see how, how the candidates Kind of feel about them and how they how they how they view that community. Ultimately, a very primal thing. It's that a very is, primal thing. So even is this person if, my friend or are they against me? If you are if you are characterized in somewhat um, less than human terms, and uh, you're referred to as an alien, and uh, you are uh, uh, put in a frame that you're not really familiar with and is really kind of demeaning and insulting, um, you're not going to tend to embrace those candidates, even though those candidates are, are, you know, they may be speaking to their base and it may, you know, fly really well with some of their supporters, but it's not flying really well in the Latino community. Um, the self-deportation of Mitt Romney, and I think um, his, one of his former campaign staffers said, boy, if, you know, 
we wish we hadn't really framed it in, in, in those terms. So in that sense, it, it's a litmus test. Even though two-thirds of the Latinos in this country are native-born, they're born here, and the largest um, increase in Latinos in the United States are citizens. They're native-born people of Hispanic heritage. So the immigration may not affect them directly, but they may know people who, who it affects. And when you have um, kids who have basically been raised here and brought here as children, and you have politicians say, oh, you know, their parents ought to be deported. And even some, uh, and a lot of the Republican candidates who are saying, oh, you know, we need to think about immigration in terms of economics and in terms of work and what this country really needs for the workforce. Latinos are thinking about the mom and the dad who have been deported and how are they going to get them back or, or thinking about the fear of having a, a parent um, deported um, and, and having that separation. So it's really, it's really a disconnect. But with that said, and for as much as we cover Latinos in terms of immigration, and we cover immigration with, through a Latino lens, the most important, two most important issues for Latinos are the economy and jobs, which includes a higher minimum wage, and education, because they want their, they understand that their kids are never going to progress if they don't have that education. Robert, uh, let me ask you about foreign policy. Um, we have uh, collectively here for the last few minutes said almost nothing about it, said almost nothing about the fight against ISIS, the fight against Islamic extremism. Um, clearly, if we direct our coverage in the campaign to things that voters most instinctively know a little bit about and can relate to, foreign policy wouldn't be it. Um, is that myopic? And do reporters covering the race have an obligation to uh, put those issues front and center and make people think about it more? I think reporters should listen to what they're hearing at these forums for candidates in South Carolina today. There was a heavy discussion on foreign policy. And always have your antenna up to what's out there, uh, what people are really speaking about. I think foreign policy uh, is already on the campaign trail a central issue. Uh, one of the most interesting sides, because there's not much of a primary on the Democratic, in the Democratic Party, it's really the hawkish element of the Republican Party where is that moving? Is Rand Paul really going to make a coherent argument for something that's contrarian on foreign policy? Does he have the political appetite to do so? And, and really looking at some of the f more fringe candidates, when you think of John Bolton, perhaps, Peter King of New York, all thinking about running as hawks. Why is that? Why, are, why, are, why is this their fear in some of the Republican ranks about this? Uh, uh, this is, uh, Please don't uh, tell me what those guys are running. We've got too many candidates. <laughs> I think they're seriously considering bids. And uh, we'll see how how far they go, but um, we've got a can we've got a candidate debate CNBC does in uh, Colorado in November, and right now we we were making a list, and there are something like 17 potential candidates. <laughs> that is not you're not going to get a good debate out of that. Uh, I, I'm really one of the things I always try is it's so easy to get immersed in the political debate within a party about the hawks versus the doves within the GOP, or perhaps on the Democratic side, those who are more uh, interventionists versus those who are not. Uh, but it's, it's important, I, I always find when I go to Iowa, New Hampshire, talk to voters because it, it's the Islamics, it, it's not, they're not really in the hawk dove debate. Uh, they're, ta they're, they're really concerned more about ISIS and they're thinking about Israel and they're, they're bringing up issues that aren't always on the front burner of the political scene, but will really help you inform you about when these ads start coming out in the fall and the primary, why are Republicans taking a certain line of foreign policies? Because they're hearing the same things uh, you hear when you ask those kind of questions. Um, Perry, I want to ask you how you think about and how you think we collectively should think about general, generational issues in the campaign. Because when I, when I am uh, looking at a set of economic issues uh, and how we respond to stagnant middle class incomes, for example, one of the choices that politicians face is uh, we sink an enormous amount of money uh, in entitlement programs serving senior citizens. And we have a re very um, uh, low spending levels on some of the issues, building blocks of future growth uh, that are important to younger people. And there's a, a racial tilt to the need there, right? Because the African American and Hispanic populations are younger than the white populations. How do you cover the two sides of a generational 
uh, fight over resources and uh, what's the best way to approach that? I mean, my sense is to kind of simplify. That's a, that was a, that's a really complicated. That's a complicated, complicated question. Mm -hmm. My sense is a way to simplify it in some ways. You had and people. We tend not to think that what politicians say in campaigns actually matters, but it really does. President Obama is working, as he said, his Iran policy and his Cuba policy are what he was talking about in 2007. I'm going to engage more. Here's I'm going to. So what I would look at is like these specific things. For example, Senator Warren has talked about the idea of increasing Social Security benefits, and Bernie Sanders has his well. So that's how I would cover this in terms of that's a, a few years ago the, all the debate was about how do we reduce Social Security benefits and what are the best ways to do that. If there's a part of the Democratic coalition that's talking about increasing those benefits, what does Secretary Clinton think about that? How does she deal with that issue? On the other hand, you've had You can the, do both things, of course. You can raise them at the bottom and yes, lower this is them great, at the top. Right. But I, the writing of the details of those choices are, I think, worth doing. And the Republican side, Chris Christie's come out for raising the retirement age from 62 to 64. So my first thing would be to ask every Republican candidate I saw, do you, I don't, that idea is not popular in the electorate, is my understanding. And so I would ask every Republican candidate, do you, you know, why is the term, why should it go up? What age should it go up to? Because I think that's a kind, that's the kind of plan that you can really, voters are bored by a lot of policy issues. They really do understand Social Security and they do care about it a lot. And so I would write about that and that, that in those plans in some specific detail. Um, I think we want to open it up to questions from the uh, audience. So we have got a microphone. Who's got one? I Axelrod's got one. <laughs> um, and, it, and I want to, uh, I can speak up. I, mm -hmm. I want to follow up on some, thanks. You know, um, this point that you're raising about listening to people is really important. And I remember in 1998 when I got calls in January of 98 from some reporters in Washington when the Monica Lewinsky story was breaking. And many of them said, well, do you, don't you think he's going to have to resign and how long do you think that will take, he being Bill Clinton, for those who aren't following along. <laughs> and, um, and I went to the aforementioned Manny's, I'm trying to tie everything together in our day, <laughs> here, to think this over. And there was, a, there was a cashier there named Helen who was an elderly woman. And she called me over and she said, can I talk to you? I said, yeah. She said, I'm not here because I want to be. She said, you know, my husband's sick. I'm not well. We get Medicare. It doesn't cover everything. We got to pay our bills too. Social Security doesn't cover it. So I'm working because I have to. And she said, I think this guy Clinton's trying to help us. So why don't they get off his back? I don't care about his sex life. So I got back to the office and I called all the reporters and I said, you guys better come out and talk to, I think there may be something going on out here that you're not hearing. And uh, it reminded me of what Gary Hart once told me, which is that Washington's always the last to get the news. Uh, so the question is, how as reporters um, do you approach the campaign so that you're uh, looking at the race from the standpoint of the American people? You said what are the important issues? It seems to me they're going to determine that, which is the point you're making. But news organizations, for reasons of cost, in some, uh, you know, to some degree, seem to be investing less in just going out and talking to people. And we have all these tools that help us ostensibly divine what people are thinking without ever leaving the comfort of our own computer screens. So how do you overcome that in campaign coverage? Michelle? I think that's a I think that's a great question, and as a desk editor in Washington, it's one that I grapple with many times a day. I mean, the copy comes in, and and I have tremendous respect for my colleagues. I don't think there are any better political reporters in the business. They're certainly you know they're they are it, um, but many of them have spent a substantial portion of their careers in Washington, and I. You spend your day reminding them that not only the language they're using is really siloed and really specific for people inside the Beltway, but that that maybe there are some some other points of view that need to be addressed. I'm not, and, and you raise it, and and then I end up going to the news editors or to the bureau chief and saying maybe you know we need to. We need to consider this, and maybe there should be some questions that are being asked of, of some of the voters. 
um, as well as you know, taking a look at Twitter, taking a look at Facebook, and trying to to track what's out there. Robert, let me ask you uh, on David's point. You know, I, I've been in a lot of discussions within newsrooms about the value of, say, um, door knocking journalism as compared to uh, other ways of approaching stories that are important. Why can't polling answer the question that David uh, posed, which is, why can't polling tell us what voters think are important and we make a departure from there? I think you can find a balance. I think polling has a, a critical role to play. At the same time, I, I think it's the reporter's responsibility to get beyond the poll and to find, even if it's anecdotal, and I'm not saying an anecdote on the trail or it, a Manny's means everything, but it means something. And you have to, to ask yourself, if, to, can you ease out of the bubble when, you're, when the campaign's such a rush, when everything's happening so frantic, and you look at your itinerary for the day, and there are 12 events, and if one of the stops is Manny's, do you take the time to talk to the owner of Manny's, to figure out why they're picking Manny's, uh, who's eating at Manny's? And to really kind of immerse yourself in the moment beyond just a stop and to think about the people and the campaign as something that's living and breathing and you have to smell it, you have to hear it, and, and it's tough to do because it's, you just think, what's the next event, what's the next ad that's coming out, where are they in the polls, and you're always going to cite the polls in your piece. But to really get the, the campaign under your fingernails, and it took me a long time in 2012 to get a, a feeling that I actually got what was happening by just constantly looking behind the scenes about where these candidates are, why they're there, what it all means, and just every day is just force that. David, let me certainly just ask get, you. You certainly get the smell of it at Manny's. Yeah, you, you can. <laughs> but let me ask you to pose a question to you. Can polling do that for us? Certainly we saw in the aftermath of the Lewinsky scandal, notwithstanding all of the coverage, Bill Clinton had very robust approval ratings. So in that sense, the what you got at Manny's from the cashier you were getting every day in opinion polls. Yeah, I mean, the, the problem with opinion polls is that they're only as good as the, the output is only as good as the input. So if you don't really know exactly what questions, you, you may know that Clinton is, uh, is holding up. You won't necessarily know why. Uh, and sometimes the way polls are, the way polling questions are asked uh, kind of bias. The, well, we had a long discussion on this yesterday. But there are limitations to polling. I'm a big fan of focus groups. I think they can be helpful. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, that uh, the approach that Robert just outlined is the is the the right approach. You know, which is to not. I think polling becomes a debilitating crutch in some ways for all of us in politics and in the media. Perry, related question. So, uh, depending on the uh, makeup of the group of political reporters. Um, some reporters will feel more comfortable going in some Manny's and or other kinds of uh, places than others. And if African Americans are underrepresented or if Hispanics are underrepresented, you, you, you may not uh, hit the diversity of all the Manny's delis out there. Uh, t <laughs> tell me uh, how you see this question of how we get on the ground, where we get on the ground, and how that informs the stuff that we cover. So my sense is we, I know the campaign is happening in Iowa and New Hampshire, but those are actually not very aggressively unrepresentative places for the country in terms of like their ethnic background and so on. I don't think, like my concern is not that we're not going to talk to enough regular voters, is that we, we're, in all, we're all in Baltimore in the last two weeks and we're going to leave. Where we were all in Ferguson and now we leave. Where we were, to, you know, when Obama goes to the Everglades, we talk about climate change that day. I actually think we have a pretty good sense of what the important issues are. Climate change, income inequality, uh, with, you know, racial issues like what happened in Baltimore. I think the key is can we maintain coverage about that more and who's winning a little bit less? Like have, have some kind of plan of like what are we think of the other six or seven important agenda items? And if Scott Walker gives a speech about a bunch of other things that day, why don't we, and he has the same CTGA four or five days ago, why don't we ask him? Evaluate yeah. how well we're doing on that so far in this campaign. I, um, I, I don't think we're doing particularly, I mean, I've, I've put myself in this group too. I think the, the campaign coverage is so much about 
who's winning? And that's just one question. And we, we, we give people a or thousand. Or who's raising the most money. Who's, that's, a, that's a proxy of who's winning. And so we spend, we just spend too much time on who's winning and not a quite, like the election is about who's winning, but it's also about what they're going to do once they win. The, the election is not about Scott Walker and Marco Rubio. It's about the 300 million people who are like in the country they live in. And so we, that's the challenge is how do we maintain that each day? That's what I was trying to talk about in terms of, can you ask like, like the day that Bruce Jenner announced that he was transgender, I would, I would, if you're on the campaign trail that day and you're with Hillary, I'd much rather ask her, what did you think about that? The next president's gonna deal with transgender Americans. This president has, to deal, has dealt with gay Americans and set some real policy on that. So the next president's gonna deal with transgender Americans. I'd much rather ask her about that than whatever her speech was, it was the same it was yesterday. The more we can figure out how do we, I don't think, think reporters is at the end of it, but the American public is engaged in issues like Baltimore. They're engaged. Bruce Jenner was watched by 17 million people when he made his comments. And I know that seems like a celebrity story, but it, but what, you know, the, the state of transgender America is actually a subject I would love to hear the candidates talk about. And I just feel like in general, we spend, we spend a lot of time asking candidates, somebody asked, one of my, you know, one of the reporters I saw asked that when Scott Walker, you know, are you the front runner? Is Jeb Bush the front runner? What is the purpose of such a question? Uh, you know, yeah. and, and Robert, on Perry's question, uh, how are we supposed to react to the fact that he said, you know, you'd like to hear Hillary Clinton on transgender? I think she's taken like five questions, you know, since she's been campaigning. Literally. Uh, what are we supposed to do about that? Well, one, I think reporters got to be much more aggressive in pushing for interviews and, and pushing for interviews with principals. Uh, I think the press corps gets bossed around too much. I think it's abhorrent how the press is usually treated by campaigns. And I think reporters too often let flax especially get away with murder when it comes to messaging, spin. Uh, I, I mean, if there's anything reporters agree together, I think it's in 2016, be more aggressive. Don't, don't let the campaigns maintain. How can how you make they, a campaign uh, I think, I make, make Hillary Clinton give I you an interview? I think reporters accept because I've they're been under trying, intense pressure. <laughs> I, think I would like to know this. I think we're all under such intense pressure, regardless of which institution you work for, that it's 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 hard sometimes to push back because you're under pressure to produce content. Uh, but I think it just uh, when it comes to the the, the, sec the question about Secretary Clinton, it, she should be asked more questions. But I also think you ha in this environment, if she's not going to take questions, or if a Republican candidate is not going to take questions, you need to also be aggressive in finding ways from the outside in. And I always, my, my tool usually is to find people who are not getting the pre-approved talking points from the campaign. Right. Who are the friends, the allies, the confidants from campaigns past, past advisors, people who are going to be candid. And, and even if they're just on background, you hopefully get them on the record. Uh, but the, the, the Kevin Maddens and Stephanie Cutters of the world, they're very useful in giving you the campaign line, and they play an important role. But if you really want to understand the context of a candidate, they're often not that useful. And you have to find other people to populate your, your uh, Rolodex or whatever you have with those, with those names. Michelle? I think that um, Paul Lewis made a really important point in the last panel, and that was the three, in the last three elections, the three Three seminal moments came not from political journalists and people who are covering the campaigns, mm -hmm. but from citizen journalists. And I think we do need to look more at that nexus of, uh, not citizen journalists, but citizens who are in, who have the access, voters who have the access, because they are the ones who are getting the access. We're not getting the access, they're getting the access. So it goes back to what Mr. Axelrod was saying about touching base with those folks who are out there to find out what is on their mind, and then also mining the social media, the folks that are, are posting the, the videos and the photos and the, and the tweets out of, out of those campaign events that we just we can't get into. John, I reject your premise a little bit in that the Huffington Post did this excellent story the other day where they went back and figured out what were the candidates' views on the 2008 bailout. These people all have 12 press secretaries each. Just, add, I mean, do we need to have Hillary on the on camera? That'd be great, but I don't think realistically we should just ask the questions. And if they give it through a spokesman, that's. I think the the sort of notion we have to have the candidates on camera every 10 seconds is. Ultimately, I want to know what her view is on TPP. No. If Nick Merrill says it, I, that's fine. I just want to know what her position is. Not, you know, that's what I want to get at. Is like, 
Whether she's on, whether she does a press avail every day, I'd love her to do that. I don't care. I want to get what her view is on the issues. If she's, if her spokesmen are also stonewalling, we should say that, uh -huh. and that's important. But I think the sort of, do, will she take seven? Qu she's not going to take a lot of questions. She's the front runner. I get that. Um, but I, we can figure out a way to answer the core questions as opposed to focusing on the access. Is what I would say. David, if anybody in this room would know how to make a campaign make their candidate accessible, it would be you. Is there a way to pressure a campaign in a strong position? A campaign in a strong position? Yes. Like a front runner, like this. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that if it becomes a, a, a meme in the press, in, in the media writ large, that the candidate is, is, is cloistered, um, I think you do feel that, you know, people will cough up the candidate, uh, you know, a little bit more readily. Um, you know, we just had a long sidebar discussion about the fact that I think authenticity is an important element of, of, of being a viable candidate for president. And it's hard to convey that unless you expose yourself a little bit to, uh, to questions. The one thing I would say is, um, like I, when I was working in the White House, um, you know, uh, we did an awful lot of uh, interviews with local TV markets, and the White House press corps got very uh, offended by that and said, you know, he's just trying to dodge the really hard and sophisticated <laughs> questions that we would ask. And, and no, that was the point. The truth is that more people watch their local newscast than a lot of the stuff that the folks in the White House, you know, sure. vehicles that they. Right. So, um, uh, you know, there may be different ways in which you choose to answer questions. It may not be in a press scrum, uh, but but I think that there is a way to pressure. And there should be a way to pressure candidates to to be uh, available to some in some form or fashion. Henry. Yeah, I, I want to go back to what Michelle said, and she was referencing what Paul Lewis said. Is he still here? Hi, uh, which I think is one of the most important things we heard today, which is th this shift from, and he, so he's talking about access reporting, but the access, that's what's shifted. Mm -hmm. So the access is not to right. we all, the access is to, is more and more to voters. And so I'd be really curious to hear from each of you, John, John included, are there specific things that you're gonna do this cycle to acknowledge that fundamental shift in how campaigns are operating and you know a decreasing amount of access and information for traditional journalists and more for what we might think of as you know potential citizen collaborators um, in how we do our work uh, i'd say real quick i think this this time right now just as it was in 2011 is the most important time of the campaign for reporters because you can get a little bit of access of seeing the candidate and really building the relationship with people in these early states and the swing states that are going to pay off long term once all those walls come down with access. Uh, I, I find the ally is the key to campaign reporting. You have to find the allies and you can get those email and that's, that's the other secret I always find. Get the Gmail, get the cell phone, get the office number, get the home number and just be aggressive in asking for those four things because if you get those of allies, the campaigns can put up as many walls as they want with access, but then you at least have a network of 20 to 30 people per candidate who uh, you have constant reach to. And that really gets the campaigns irritated eventually, but those allies, uh, that's, that's your key in a world where it's cloistered. I think I disagree with the, I think the reporters who covered Al Gore had more access to him than the ones who covered uh, President Obama in 2012. I'm not sure they did a particularly better job. I think that, uh, to, be, to be blunt about it, I think that I read like this website, Vox. I don't know if you all read that or not. I learn a lot about the campaign from that website. They have very little, a very low travel budget and therefore very little access. They do a lot of like really substantive. It might be time to think about if we're not going to get access anyway, and I would argue access didn't give us a lot when we had it in terms of like a discussion about the public policy decisions and thoughts of these people. I don't know if we were getting a lot of the to begin with. It might be time to think about we're not getting the access, so why don't we think about how do we like covering the campaign differently. Marco Rubio was the Speaker of the House in Florida and made a lot of decisions. Why don't we write about those as a lens into his governing strategy? Hillary Clinton was the Secretary of State for four years. I, my guess is that'll give us a clue to her foreign policy approach would be talk about that as opposed to you know getting access to her to ask her what are the sort of the news of the day questions. I think some of this uh, 
like I'm a journalist, I covered 2004, I had a lot of access to John Kerry. I think there's a little bit of times of nostalgia for that when, my sense is I was out with Scott Walker a few days ago, I don't think he's getting access to anybody except for like Breitbart.com. I don't think that other people are getting a lot of access in terms of citizens either. I think that the, we may be in a sort of a post-access era and I know, I follow sports a lot too and right now they're having the same problem. LeBron James does not want to talk to the Sports Illustrated unless he has something he wants to give. He has a, millions of Twitter followers. So does President Obama, so does Hillary Clinton. They don't need anybody to, like, to really talk to. So we have to think about if access is done, what can we give the what can we give people outside of like here's a transfer what they said? Miles, let me just say one word on behalf of politicians. Um, <laughs> it's, it's also true that if it's also true that if uh, what you get when you provide access is a whole bunch of stupid questions. I agree about with that completely. Process and gotcha questions and you know I appreciate your point on transgender, but you can see where. They could go I, 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 I turn into a game there as well. If you want to, I, I think most of them are willing to have substantive conversations, uh, but most of the conversations that go on, uh, you know, or a lot of the conversations that go on between candidates and scrums tend to become less than substantive and more about how do we, how do we get them to commit news today? Right, right. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and the last point I'd make is, uh, you know, I think it's important for every journalist to understand that in the, in the real world, nobody's really that interested in the presidential race right now because they're living their lives. They're right. dealing with daily challenges. And it's more important really to shine a light on what those daily challenges are and how those might ultimately inform their decisions when they do focus on the race. But all this other stuff, this is just sports writing. Right, you know? I totally agree. So. so who else has got a question? Oh, we, I up. told him we've got time for one or two more. <laughs> hey, Daryl Rowland from the Columbus Dispatch. I just wanted to say, um, you know, and this is not to contradict Dave, uh, Columbus, Ohio, if you were here yesterday, you heard us mentioned all the time, that's where campaigns were targeting for. Um, to this day, despite repeat requests, we've never gotten an interview with, uh, with either candidate or, or President Obama in either campaign. So. Um, my daughter went to Oberlin College, <laughs> and there was an interview given to the college newspaper while she was there, uh, well, but never to uh, uh, the Columbus Dispatch, 614-461. Really? <laughs> I like that. I like that. What, what network is that? No, I, I, mean, I bet you, I guarantee you that he's done interviews with uh, your local television outlet, so probably. Pro probably TV, yeah, but not, you know, Understood. that doesn't do me any good. That, yeah. I, I understand that, and I'm feeling for you here, man. But, uh, <laughs> but I'm just telling you that from the standpoint of the decision makers, if you're going to afford some time, your goal is to reach as many people as possible, and, those, and, and the local television outlets right. are an effective way to do it. But I, I, I don't mean, look, I'm a print guy. I came from print. I have a bias that way, but the work, you know, uh, you know, most of the people I know aren't picking up newspapers, you know, so yeah. I mean, a lot of people I know are, but most of the people, you know, especially yeah. the 50 aren't. All right, we got one but last there's question. There's websites and there, there, there's video. Sure. It it's kind of goes back to what was said yesterday by the candidates on the people that they don't need us anymore. Yeah. I agree. All right, this is the last one. I'm getting uh, the high sign. So I'm just wondering, it's been touched on a little bit, but I'm wondering if the panel can address it specifically about um, how coverage is helped or hindered when political reporters consider themselves too much a part of the political machine and maybe don't look at politics and politicians from maybe an outsider's perspective outsiders perspective and the people and the issues that they're covering and how does that kind of impact the overall coverage access and a lot of the issues we've been talking about today don't, don't be snarky I think the people who work in campaigns when I talk to them they, they this is their life on the their career on the line every day intense pressure in the campaign and this is their whole they're dedicated to this endeavor and then when they watch reporters get snarky in, in, in on Twitter and elsewhere in their writing, it has, uh, has consequences. And so uh, stick to reporting, and I think your access, chances of access are better. Um, I'm going to make a plug for a book. It's called, I think it's really helpful to cover the campaign. It's called The Party Decides. And that's a way to think of it, called The Party Decides. And it's a good way to look at campaigns actually are not 
in some ways not, it's not about Scott Walker winning, winning all the votes. It's in some ways about does the Republican Party choose Scott Walker or not? So you can, you can cover the campaign from the outside in some ways by thinking about the center of the story is really not about Hillary Clinton. It's like, is she for debt-free college? Is she for body cameras? And if you cover from that angle, you know, bringing the ideas back into them as opposed to what are they doing and what is her hair color change and so on, then it's much easier to cover the campaign. There's a more, it requires less access. And it's actually, most people are not obsessed with political celebrities in the first place. It's actually a more valuable way to cover the campaign, I would say. Michelle, how do we stay out of the political establishment and keep an outsider's point of view? Well, I think from, you know, especially with a wire service, especially with, with, with a wire service like the Associated Press, I mean, you're, we're servicing hundreds of papers and hundreds of, if not thousands, of news outlets across the country. So it's very difficult to get granular and really kind of on the street in order to elevate those stories to the level of a political campaign. It's much, um, it's much more efficient, rightly or wrongly, to cover the institution and to cover the campaign and to cover the horse race. And um, especially since the, especially for te especially since for text, the real estate, the amount of space that, that's available has just evaporated. So where once reporters were, had the opportunity to write 1,500 words and include all of the detail and the color, that's gone. And if we're lucky if anywhere between 400 and 600 words is now being used to, to cover a campaign. And so the focus has to be much more, has to be much tighter. I, I disagree with the premise of the question a little bit that um, the reporters are part of the um, political establishment, as it were. They become so part of the campaign that they really don't have the, the distance. I think that um, there's a tremendous balancing act that goes on to be able to get information from people who don't necessarily want to be as candid as you would like them to be, while at the same time having enough distance that you're coming up with story ideas that are um, that are going to be of interest to to readers and to editors. And I would just say, if if anybody on this panel is uh, might be vulnerable to that idea, that charge, it would be me. I grew up inside the Beltway. My dad was a political journalist. I've been around this process for a long time. All I can say is that what I try to do in covering the process, I'm I'm uh, mindful of uh, issues related to the horse race, but I try to keep uh, in my own head, front and center, what's real, what is, what is uh, possible to happen if this person or that person gets elected, what's likely to happen, and understand how the uh, election gets translated into uh, public policy in the lives of uh, people in the country. And uh, I would, I, I think that's a good prescription. We all fall short of that, but do the best we can. John and, did this great interview with Ted Cruz. If you Google it, it's a really good example of asking real questions that are not silly. And he really got in the questions that I had, too. And it was a really great interview. Google Ted, Ted CNBC, John Harwood, Ted Cruz. Take it out. I think that's a great example of what to do in this job. Would you guys join me in thanking our panel, Michelle, Perry, and Robert? So uh, first of all, I want to congratulate all of you survivors <laughs> hung through all these two days. Um, it's been kind of thrilling for us to have you um, because we're both, we're all in both organizations are invested in better, smarter, richer coverage of uh, this next campaign. And we're really lucky to have such great panelists here and on each and every one of these panels that, I, that hopefully will help uh, you do your, your jobs uh, a little better. I think a lot of the subtext of the discussion here goes to one fundamental question, which is that uh, we can either cover politics as a game, and I admit I'm, it's a, it can be fun that way for those who are involved, or we treat it as something real, that has real consequences for people, for the country, for the world, um, and approach it uh, from that standpoint, and it would be good for the country um, if we did more of that uh, and really wrote this election 
from the standpoint of the people who are ultimately going to be uh, impacted by the decisions that are made at every level uh, of government. I want to thank my old colleague, Anne Marie Lipinski. This whole thing was actually a scheme for us to get together again after all these years. <laughs> so, I mean, she was, she was, she was a, a child when I first met her at, at the Chicago Tribune, but, uh, but a, a, a really outstanding journalist in her own right uh, and uh, doing important work now. And this, your investment in this is a, is a uh, reflection of that. So with that, let me turn the microphone over to you. Thank you, David. And I was just remembering, we are the only two journalists or former journalists you've ever met who've never had a cup of coffee. Yes. Tea drinkers. <laughs> ah, we have three in the room. Um, I, uh, David was right to point out what an amazing um, group of panelists we've had now, but really for the last two days. But I wanted to um, also pay tribute to the secret ingredient this weekend, uh, which is all of you. The questions have been outstanding. And whoever it was who said earlier, we make the mistake of thinking of audience engagement as something that happens online, um, as opposed to something that happens for real with real people. This is, you guys have made this, um, these couple of days really spectacular, and especially for you stalwarts who um, stayed to the very um, end, not the bitter end, the really um, fantastic end that John and the rest of the panelists gave. So um, thank you all so much uh, for that. Um, please stay engaged with us. This will all be up on the website. Um, a lot of it already is, a lot of the resources. But we'll also have video of all of today, which again was um, on the record, so feel free to share it or talk about it um, in any way that you want. And um, I know surveys are pain to fill out, so if you don't want to fill out you know, every last box, just give us a general sense of how you think it went and whether or not um, something like this, exactly like it, a modified this, is something you'd be um, interested in the future. Uh, you know, when David and I first talked about is this something we could do together, because we discovered we were independently working on something, we didn't know, and we said, let's try it. And so we'd love to know if, if you think um, that this kind of partnership works um, as well from you know, a political institution, a journalism institution, coming together to talk about this important work. And the other thing is, I just want to say, I, I, gosh, if any of you want me to go out on the campaign with you, I would love that. I'd love, <laughs> I'd love to get my notebook out again. This has been inspiring um, for that way, too. And, I, and then I hope, in turn, for you guys. And Godspeed with your work. And if there's anything Neiman can do to help you with that in the months ahead, please, um, please do let us know. So, And a final thank you to David and Steve and all the people um, from the IOP and to Stephanie and all my colleagues. Um, at Neiman, thank you so, so much.